Am I okay like this or it's not a good look? How long was it? 23 minutes. Yeah, and you're going to cut that down to about five. Time Megan gets her sword out. <laughs> cut down five minutes. There you go, Bradley. Welcome to season two, episode 10. Talking about the escape today, the exit strategy. If you're joining me for the first time, my name is Brad Hogan. I'm a business guy here in Central Florida, and I'm just talking about pivoting through business, pivoting through life and what it takes. And in many cases, as small business owners, we're risking it all to make it happen. It comes to that time in either the business cycle or in life when we're ready to exit. And what's that look like? What do we do? I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about us as business owners, what we're looking for, what we're looking to do, what our options are, and then also what's the buyer looking for. But in any case, you need to have a plan in mind. You hear this over and over that know the exit strategy before you begin. Well, that's great. That's a great concept and you should do that. But many times our business doesn't end up looking like the vision we started out with. And that's okay. That's most of us in business. It takes a twist. It takes a turn. And you've got to change. You got to change with the times. You got to change with the economy. You got to change with your market, with your sector, um, whether that's where you live or it could be laws, regulations, etc. All those things. What's your business look like? today or at the time when you're getting ready to exit and how do we do that we do need to start making plans for that exit strategy and what it looks like so the basic premise is it's kind of like selling a house when you're selling your business in that we want maximum value in most cases there are some exceptions there's cases where hey the business is big enough Let's just give it to the kids. We've made enough money. I want to share some statistics with you. What's happening right now in our economy. Approximately 40% of those that are selling their business will do it within the next five years. So in the next five years, approximately 40% of small business is going to transfer ownership. And that's way up. That's because the baby boomers are getting older. More people are retiring. It's, I'm looking at that number going, is, can that be right? I mean, 40%? Yeah, there's a lot of small businesses out there. Think about your hometown. I'm thinking about my little town here. Just down the street from me, there was a mechanic, and looks like he's closed up shop. And I don't know for sure if someone actually came in and did an asset purchase. I don't know if he closed down his business and just sold off his assets, but no one's in that location. Someone didn't buy the business and the location and move in there. Point is, I noticed that one, those are happening all over. We'll bring up another point. What about buying another business that complements yours? I mean, different subject, but it falls in line with the same thing we're talking about, exit strategy people selling their business, et cetera. 40% will sell in the next five years. Of those 40%, 50% of those will sell outside the family. So that's going to be transferred to someone other than a family member. 25% of businesses sold will go to a family member. 25% will totally liquidate their business. 25% of those sold of that 40%, either a successor or someone coming in buying, etc. And in many cases, we find when it's family member, they've been trained or groomed or been active in the business. That last number, liquidating the business, what am I talking about? It's you know, if you've got a furniture store, we've all seen the furniture liquidation, right? Well, that's all asset based. Let's sell that. But what if I've got a service based company? You know, what am I liquidating? 
there's not as much to liquidate. I mean, what do we have? We can't can't sell employees. Maybe we own the building. What's left? I mean, is it office furniture, used computers? That might be it if we're in a service-based business. If we own a, a mechanic shop, you know, certainly we've got a few assets to liquidate, but nothing compared to what the business is. You know, the other thing to think about is those of us that are in the service business, think about the insurance guy. He's got a book of business. Think about the accounting firm. Even if someone doesn't want the firm name and the location, et cetera, there are clients there. There's a book of business, if you will, repeat customers. What's that look like? Perhaps all those look a, a little different. If we're going to sell our business, our exit strategy is let's sell it. Do we bring in the ownership? And you see how that goes. It, first of all, it's a new face. Then it's a merger of the two names their name with our name, whether it be in company or personal, then eventually it's their name or it's a holding company, you know, a subsidiary of. It's all, all those kind of things to make the transition. And that takes time. You know, reach out, seek someone that can help you with that transition. A professional has been through that and done that. But let's talk about the basic types of transfers. So number one, Transfer ownership to your children. We call that a generational transfer. All three of my kids work in my business. There's nothing like having family around. If it's done properly, <laughs> probably a whole other subject. But as far as trust and having my interest at heart, it's the family business and, and protecting that. And what's that look like? Are they too protective? You know, is, is it bad for morale when, you know, I let my daughter go on vacation? You got all those things. But as far as exit strategy goes, transfer to kids, what's that look like? My son's really in a position where he's running the day-to-day -day operations. So what's that look like going forward? How do I exit? Let's talk about the pros and let's talk about the cons of family or children. The pros are... You can stay somewhat involved because family, it's not some unknown entity or some unknown person coming in buying your business. You got more flexibility there. Probably got a guidance position where they're coming to you. You've been doing this for years. You get to be as involved or not involved as you want. I mean, does that look like that's three days a week? Now it's two days a week. We go down to a day a week. Is it a couple days a month? Do we eventually just you know, take a meritous position where we're really not involved. We're just a phone call away occasionally. What's that payout look like? Do we stay on there and keep getting paid as some part of ownership we've got or some role? Or do we set up an annuity situation where our kids can pay into or the company can pay into the annuity and kind of buy me out and pay me for the rest of my life. There's several ways to do that. The cons, the downside, the negative of selling to family or children, you know, you could have friction, you could have conflict, you don't agree on everything. Those are the downside. You've got to kind of pick your situation and understand what you want to do. And I think most importantly, if you're going to go into that situation, just define the roles. Always good. Define the roles, kind of an operating agreement thing, so everybody's real clear on where you stand and what you, the expectations of you are. Most important. The second thing here is an ESOP. It's an employee stock. What's that look like? Why do we do that? Uh, give it to your financial planner. There's some huge benefits could be a tax situation in a lot of these cases, why it would be sold to employees so we, we don't have an immediate tax burden and what we can do with those funds, et cetera. Let's talk about that in not financial ESOP terms. I'm looking to save some money. But what's that really look like and how do we do that? I'm going to turn this around a little bit. Let's look at this through the lens of a buyer. Okay, 
I've got family and I've got friends that actually go into these situations. I've, I've got a brother who just bought another law firm. And, you know, what's that look like? When he goes in there, he retained the employees, retained the attorneys, actively working those cases. So that keeps everybody happy. Everybody's employed. They're vested. They know what's going on. He worked out a viable situation for the seller where he can still pay him a percentage, but pick up the work and do do all the grunt work, do the heavy lifting, if you will. Advantageous for the seller, beneficial for the buyer. I've got a friend that is in the insurance business, extremely successful. Those of you that know anything about insurance, he's the number one sales agent in three companies for the year simultaneously. And if you're in insurance, you go, what? How's that possible? Well, he will go in then to small agencies. What he does is he buys out, he buys a book of business. He's buying out the owner and he'll take everything. If they own the building, he'll buy the building. He basically brings the employees in. They own the business. They've now got a vested interest. The downside you have to be careful of is if that attempt to buy that business is not successful, it can hurt morale. He doesn't have that situation. He's able to to work out the finances and or pay cash. He will pick out the plums, not the cherries. He's going to take the biggest accounts, the biggest clients. He's going to take them out and move them over to his office. He's going to deal with those clients. And then the rest is still a viable business and the employees are running it and he still profits from it. It's just a good formula that he's got. It's been very successful with it. Talk about another another situation for buyout. This is a little different. Let's talk about third party, selling to a third party. I've got a friend that's in the insurance business. And what he does, he will meet with an insurance agent or an agency, talks to him, and the conversation and the numbers go something like this. He says to the owner, the agent, he says, hey, you know, how you doing? Agents are doing great. Business is good. Let's talk a little personal here. What kind of money did you make last year? By the way, I'm making these numbers up, but this is how they make sense. You're not looking at me going, those numbers are way off. He goes to lunch with the agent and says, hey, you know, what kind of money did you make last year? The agent says, you know, I made $250,000 last year. Well, that's awesome. That's great. You know, what did you have to do in gross revenue in order to make that kind of money? And the guy says, well, we did about 500000 And he says, awesome. That's that's great. You got a great business there. What's that look like? And he said, well, you know, time I paid for my building, and then I've got a lot of help in the office, et cetera, paid all my overhead, paid all my dues, all my fees, all my, that's where the rest of it went. So my friend comes back and says, tell you what, we have built a brand new office building. I've got a corner office for you. Um, why don't you come over? We're going to start you at 300000 What kind of car are you driving? Driving a new Cadillac? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to buy you a Cadillac. In fact, we'll lease it for you, and we'll trade it every 12 months. You have a brand new car. Do you own the building you're in? You own that? We're going to buy that building. So what my friend will do is he'll buy the real estate and then he's just going to turn around and sell it and tells the seller of the business, the agent, why don't you just take that money from your building, just put it in your retirement account, put that aside. You'll have no more to worry about. You don't have to stay awake at night worrying about payroll or vacation or anything. Your time's your time. We'll start you at 300000 and anything you sell going forward, we're just going to split it 50-50. You can still make more money. In fact, you're going to make a lot more money because now you don't have to worry about running the business. You can just concentrate on your accounts. You'll have a lot more free time. You're not going to be able to bring all five girls with you. We've got support staff. We've got everything you need. Pick your best girl and bring her over. We'll pay her salary. So what's happened there is 
it's five hundred thousand dollars annually in gross revenue. What my buddy's now responsible for is a three hundred thousand dollars salary, an automobile, the support staff, which is one gal. So when we get all done, you know, there's a there's a hundred thousand dollars left over that my buddy profits. And he just does that over and over and over, and he's built it into a huge company, easily seven-figure income. That's from the buyer's perspective, but from the seller's perspective, you can see how advantageous that is. He's really sold and made a deal on eventually where his book of business is going to go, but able to stay in the deal, if you will. A lot of those sellers that go in that situation, they're looking to exit soon is where that comes in. And then finally, you know, we talk about liquidation. What's that look like? We're just, we're just going to do an asset sale. We're going to sell off whatever we've got, whether it's a book of business or the assets within the business. But basically four, four different ways to do it, right? So we've got transfer ownership to children or family. We've got employee stock in the ESOP situation. We've got a third party we could sell to or we could liquidate our business. The buyers, 61% of all buyers are looking for a stable, profitable business. Some of us, a lot of us, as small business owners, we're writing off everything. <laughs> I jokingly had lunch with one of my buddies. He's just sold his he just sold his business for tens of millions of dollars. It was an asset purchase. He's got somebody looking over his shoulder. He's in the deal. He's in the deal for a couple years to make sure it performs, etc. That's kind of normal. But he said, oh, man, you know, they're just micromanaging everything. And I laughed and I said, what's wrong? You have to pay for your own loaf of bread now? <laughs> and the point being, in small business, when we own it, a lot of times we're writing off everything. I'm talking about legal, legitimate, et cetera. Uh, not trying to get in trouble with taxes and writing off stuff that we can't. But we're looking for ways to write off everything. Um, whether it's that automobile or education or whatever it might be. When you're getting ready to sell a business, you might want to get with your planner because let's stop sucking all the money out of the business and let's show that the business truly is profitable. Here is the 500000 that I take out every year and, you know, whatever. It's, it's in the lake house. It's in the condo in Aspen. It's in the, it's in the boat and the truck and the house. And maybe it's in all of the real estate that I'm buying for retirement. You know, how, how do we transfer that? 31% of buyers are looking for a growing, profitable business. So they're looking for growth. 61% want stable. 31% want growth and profitability. And then only 8% are looking for a turnaround. That's a business that is has potential, but it's unprofitable. It's not profitable at the time. That's 8%. Your best bet is to show the profitability in the company so that you're not having to sit there and explain, well, I know there's no money in the company, but we really are profitable. Hey, it's a real deal. It's a real situation. So no matter what you guys are thinking, no matter where you're at in your business right now, no matter which path you're thinking of taking, you know, get a plan, get a plan, give it some thought, meet with some people. If you've got questions, you've got comments, I've been through this a few times, hit me up down below. Love you guys. See you in the next one.